it's Jackie Barry here, author of the new book of Icebreakers and Energizers for Speakers and Trainers. I'm here today with Angela Della. Hello, Angela. Hello, Jackie. Lovely to be here. Thank you. And what Angela does is, I'm looking at her website now, <laughs> help everyone and everything in business pull willingly in the same correct direction. And one of the ways she does this is through simple pictures, compelling stories, and metaphors. Now, Angela, why don't you tell us a bit more about that, and particularly how and whether you use audience participation activities as part of your sessions? Yeah, so I typically work with um, the business owners, leaders, the board, the management team, but I also work with groups of, of MDs as well. Um, and what I love and um, what my background is, is, um, is using a lot of picture and metaphor to help people almost bypass some of their logical, rational thinking and start to describe what's happening in a business through metaphor um, and through Can pictures. Can you give us an example of pictures and metaphors that help? Of course. So my favourite one is that I use a rowing boat and I use the boat to represent the business. I say the seats on the boat are the roles in the business and then on every seat you have a person and every seat on that boat is really necessary and um, everyone brings with them an awe of potential energy and immediately people start to get it they get it so I, and so I ask questions about what's what are the oars doing are they all rowing in unison um, or how long are the oars how well are people equipped to row and know how to row and therefore you know kind of it relates back to their role in the business and then I also play around with how um, what the business what they, what what are the senior people in the business doing so are they hopping from seat to seat and it makes the, the, the boat rock and makes it difficult for the team are they on a seat where the, where the team needs someone to direct them so yeah it's just using visual imagery to help people to really get that context back in their business. Going back then to activities, yep. like icebreakers and energizers, do you also incorporate them to help get your message across? Yes, yes, exactly. So where um, that would be, I have a, a great image where um, it's what I call red zone, where people are feeling uncomfortable, put up the image and then ask people to discuss what, what do they see going on in their business that relates to it. And it's got things like cross doors, it's got people rowing in a boat on their own, it's got kind of red jaggedy lines coming from, from people um, in terms of not being happy, it's got people who are throwing the oar away. So getting them to really connect and communicate um, in a way that's that's in their context, but using the you know kind of uh, as I say the visual imagery to do that. This is what I think is interesting: that audiences who book speakers and trainers and presenters and facilitators seem to me less and less to want to just sit there and listen like a lecture at school or college or university. The more you make them do themselves, the more they actually learn. Yeah. I think there's a real change in expectation. I mean, people want knowledge, but they want know-how as well. So it's not just know, it's know-how. Um, how do I bring this back in my context? How do I apply this immediately? And then how do I make this real to get benefits? So yeah, it's something that we can give them that's tangible is, is real value then. You also mentioned storytelling. And how does that fit then in the content that you deliver? Um, again, well, I use stories about businesses and business owners, um, and again, using sometimes very simple. So, I'll put um, in a group session, for example, a great one is just putting in different images up. So, for example, how um, you know, I'll just put up a plow or a plowed field, and say, okay, so what's what's get people in twos? What does that mean for you and your business? And it can you we get so many different you know, kind of answers. People are talking about, oh, it feels like I'm pulling a plow, or it feels like we're turning over the soil and we're really doing well. We've got great strategy with doing, you know, kind of doing the work. And it's just a great way of, of almost releasing people from the expectations and what they think they've got to say to get into well, what's really happening. 
when I was working on my book, I met David Guthrow in Canada, who has a pack of cards with beautiful visuals on that he uses in leadership conversations and deals them out. And each picture will inspire each participant to reveal something perhaps they wouldn't have otherwise accessed as an idea. So I'm totally with you on that idea of um, <laughs> using any tools that we can to help get results. Yeah. You said you work a lot with senior people and chief executive groups. How do you find they respond to getting involved in things which some people might think are a bit more uh, playful? Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of, um, I do it very kind of softly. Um, a lot of my background is in, in group dynamics and how groups work well together. And we have three psychological needs. The first of which is what we call inclusion feel part of. So I often get them to swap stories about when they felt, just in twos, very small, safe groups. Um, when did they feel really included, really part of something? How did they perform in that scenario? And what did that enable them to achieve um, for themselves, for others, for the business when that was the case? And again, swapping stories uh, you know kind of they're, they're then getting to communicate and connect individual human to human that contact and connection at that level and learn something new about each other as well and that um that kind of s smaller group safety i find works really well as you say that's a nice gentle way into uh, some kind of activity especially for those more introverted members yeah. of the group yeah. um Right. As a member of audiences yourself through the years, I'm sure you've witnessed some speakers or trainers trying to run activities that didn't work so well. Or maybe you've been in a room where somebody's done something that's been brilliant as a way of embedding their point. Can you remember either of those two extremes? I can indeed. So, um... The extreme that I really remember uh, for the good, you know, kind of, and I, and I remember it for really good reasons, is Lee Warren. And um, so Lee's a member of the Professional Speaking Association and he has his purple microphone, which is in a cube. And he throws that around the audience to get them to answer questions. And, and that in and of itself is really engaging. And, and, I, and I don't know why, I think it's because of the microphone and the kind of idea bubble that for me, visual that it represents. Um, the one thing I remember from Lee in particular was um, he gave us a phrase which was around, you know, kind of, um, I'm just going to have a quick look here. At the heart of what I do is a simple idea, dot, dot, dot. And then when we'd all had a chance to work on it, he was throwing the mic around and getting us to reveal what we'd, we'd come up with. And it was a really good way of engaging people um, with you know kind of the, the, the basically the the objective was was our value and something really tangible for us but also um, you know kind of giving them giving that more energy and and fun than just passing the microphone around absolutely I'm all about injecting energy and fun into a training or, or learning session how about an example of a time where things went a bit wrong that you can remember? Do you know, I couldn't think of anything specific, but I know the feeling of it, which is when um, it's, it's, it's when it's unclear and where the audience feels, I'm, I don't know what's expected and I might get it wrong. And immediately that gets a defensive reaction. So this element of safety and making it safe and fun for people to engage and easy that you know those are the key things that I know that from personal experience I will then kind of really get on board and go with. So what you're suggesting there it's all about absolute clarity in the instructions that you give and how to generate a feeling of safety for people to participate. Yeah. As far as I'm aware my little book is the first that targets speakers, whereas there are lots of books with icebreakers and activities for trainers. Why do you think that might be that 
speakers haven't um, traditionally incorporated this kind of audience participation in their keynote sessions? For me, this comes down to one of the kind of core things about leadership um, in around um, being so fully in service of your audience that it is not about you whatsoever. Um, and appreciating that for the audience to come on board and be on board, sometimes it's really, and it's well, a lot of the time it's really useful to actually make not just the verbal and the, and the content element of what you're doing really resonate with them in their context, but to bring them in into and, and, and as part of you know kind of the presentation as well so for me that that's what would really and, and does I've seen really work well. Okay where do you get your ideas then and, and where do you get your visuals given that you clearly incorporate lots of those in the work that you do? Well I, I'm a bit of one of these uh, I'm, I, I've got a very very visual brain and a very you know I, I need a sentence and I've gone to a visual um, and I find that a lot of particularly entrepreneurs who um, are more visual thinkers stereotypically, I mean, we're all a, vis a mixture of visual, auditory and kinesthetic, but um, a lot of um, business owners um, and entrepreneurs, they, have, um, they often have that big, you know, the vision, they can see it and then it, they can articulate that vision really well. And that's where... I think I'm able to connect with them, you know, kind of at, at that level. It's then appreciating that for every visual, and it's potentially like a balloon up in the air, then you need the people to bring it into action to get that idea going, but also the kind of feet on the ground um, to deliver it, and then the, making sure you get the results as well. So it's a, it's, it's a balance overall. Yes, I can hear from the way you talk, how your brain is automatically connecting a visual into a metaphor, into a learning point. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other advice for people that perhaps have a presentation ready to deliver, but they don't have that natural instinct that you do for pulling out pictures that are going to help make it work? What, what do you think people can do to bring those presentations more to life for their participants? I suppose this is the, the kind of coach in me is, is around asking the audience questions and then giving them that pause, that space, just to think about it for themselves and then potentially asking another question. And so that you're gradually bringing them in to what you're saying on an individual basis rather than them having to come to you, which I, th I think is a really nice way of... of thinking about it you're bringing them into your world and they're coming in as part of that and feel that, that element of inclusion so that's going back to what you were saying earlier about the importance of making them feel safe yeah have you got any other um ideas around that um so people think in different ways uh, you've got your visual um your, your people who are very kind of big picture blue sky they want bullet point part fast 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 You've got people who are people people and they want to know how that's going to connect and land and benefit people. So again, those sorts of points um, in that way will really land well. Um, for those who are really good at delivering and service, they want to know how it will be, be better for the client. And for those who are all about, you know, the results, the outcomes, how do we make it better, faster, cheaper, then again, they want facts and data. So knowing your audience and you can then tailor any element of what you do, your questions, your visuals to that um, and your activities. That is key for being a professional speaker, isn't it? Understanding yeah. that everyone in the room is different and yeah. they might all take your message on board in a slightly different way. And you have to adapt and be flexible to suit the majority of people in the room. Is there anything else that you've got on your mind that you think would be useful to people that are interested in experiential speaking, as I call it in my book? I suppose it's kind of just one tip to share is that um, part of group dynamics is that the first stage that we need to feel safe is what we call inclusion, feeling part of um, and feeling that I matter 
such that I'm on, I'm inside and I'm part of the tribe. The next thing that we need is an element of control and what's the structure, the framework, how we're going to interact and where that's very clear between us, then I gain, I, I, I move on to the next step. And the next step is then what we call openness. And openness is, the, is my willingness to really kind of show you and tell you um, about me, about what's going on, be open with you. But we need those first two to get to the third. And we often, and often what I've, you know, kind of see, um, you know, kind of, you can, you can use this within your speaking all the time, where you go into a lot of structure, then again, it's quite a, an intellectual type um, uh, exchange, as it were, where you can go into openness, but via inclusion first, bringing your audience in, then control a bit of structure about how um, and context about how this works and what maybe some guidelines are, but then into openness, then you're going through that cycle, which really brings people in and on board and makes it safe. I spoke recently to Simon Raybould from Presentation Genius. And one of the things he was saying about learning styles is that depending on what skill you're trying to teach, the appropriate channel to teach it can be different. For example, if you were trying to learn to be a bricklayer, then you pretty much have to do it. You're not going to get really good if you just watch a video or read a book or listen to a podcast on how to lay bricks. And the other approach is when you're the speaker and you've got a big audience and you don't know everybody's preferred way of taking on information, you have to mix it up yourself and try and cover all the bases to use a cliche. Yeah. Um, going back to what we were talking about earlier with Lee Warren's question throwing microphone dice, uh, <laughs> I know that uh, there are various ways of handling question and answer sessions creatively and one of the things I do is with paper throwing uh, yes. and for one benefit paper is pretty easy to transport or get more of if you run out and it's a very low-tech tactile way a bit like a giant microphone dice uh, but of collecting information from the audience which might be questions it might be their tip of the day it might be some other piece of information such as the output from their little paired discussions that you were talking about yeah. um, and they just write down the message put it on the paper turn it into a paper plane or screw it into a snowball chuck them around the room and it's another quick cheap fun easy way of their brain still processing that piece of information so the mental effort they've put into it means it's more deeply embedded um, but also adding energy in the room, bit of fun, uh, and, but still achieving the same outcome and much more interesting than your show of hands. I've, I've been in the audience with that and it's fantastic because there's the, the kind of neuroscience about writing it and then the, the fun bit of where will it go and who will get it when you throw it and then the um, reception of a, a, someone else's idea and where did that come from and wow, you know, someone else's thoughts on the same subject I, I, I've seen and I've, and I've been in one of your sessions or a couple of your sessions actually when you've used it and I think it's a fabulous, fabulous I'm so glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> I think it's good fun too it's, it's amazing exactly. to watch and as a speaker it also means you can capture some great photos and video of your talk <laughs> to show how you engage an audience which might then help you get more bookings uh, from other clients who are looking for that kind of interaction uh, so, yes, tying this back to where we started, it does seem to be a popular trend at the moment for audiences and clients to be asking for engaging, engagement. How can people reach you, Angela, and find out more about you and what you do? Well, you've, thank you. Well, you've already mentioned my website, um, which is www.angeladella.com. That's D-E-L-L-A-R. Um, I'm a member of the PSA um, and so I've got a great community there so I'm often at the, the PSA and the International Coaching Federation so and you know kind of my phone details and email are on the website too so if anyone you know kind of would like to get in touch then fabulous It'd be great to have a chat. 
Well, your sessions sound really fun and I can just imagine how uh, leadership teams can all get in their rowing boats and start rowing off in the same direction together thanks to your help. We hope so. <laughs>